Hi everyone! Uh, this is the second half of my King Diamond experience with the song At the Graves from the Conspiracy album. And I remember when I posted the, the announcement, some of you were saying, Oh, why are you going there? Oh, this is going to be... What's the... What, what is there to be found there? Or I'm going to stay away from this one. It's a wild piece. But you might be surprised at what there is in there to look at musically and and I have a lot of things I want to talk about so I want to dig in right away but first let me just kind of tell you just a quick overview of what I learned about King Diamond. So King Diamond is a Danish heavy metal band heavy metal <laughs> and this song, At the Graves, is the first on an album called Conspiracy. And this was released in 1989, which... And, and it's actually a second part of a sort of operatic kind of story, which began in, the, in a previous album called Them, which was released the year before the Conspiracy album. So that's kind of the background setup to this. Now, I didn't go listening to any of the other pieces in the album. I, I did read about the story, so I have kind of an outline of the sketch of the story. And as usual, like even many classical operas, it's kind of a, a weird, ugly story. But it seems that that is very often an inspiration for some artist to expand and, and do something about it. I have a friend who... He's an opera singer, and he said once to me, he said, I love opera. And he said, and I said, tell me why you love opera so much. He says, because it gives you the worst and the best of human nature all in one, one place. And so I guess in that sense, this fits. Anyway, let's dive in. This piece is really unsettling musically, and I would say intentionally so. How much the, the composer, the creator of the music really knew the, the systems which he was using, I don't know, because I don't know his musical education and so forth. But whether it's by, by intentional technical knowledge or by instinct, it's well done. Um, when I looked up what I could find about the story of the song, because you might remember, I was standing towards a sort of vampire influence story by the time I got to the end of my first listen. Well, it turns out it doesn't specifically intend that. It actually comes from an album, the second, which is a whole story and which is the second part of, it's kind of the part two of the story of a previous album. Of course you can expect with music like this that the content of the story is quite dark and gruesome. It is. In a nutshell, I won't go into the whole plot, the story is about the protagonist, King, King Diamond, trying to recover a kingdom which was stolen from him, and this album starts with him at his sister's grave hoping that she would be able to give him some insight into what happened previously. As weird and dark and creepy as this song is, I couldn't help but think about how these kinds of topics, stories of usurpers, conspiracies, murders, as well as the topics of death and the afterlife, are such classic subjects of art, legends, poetry, paintings, music, literature. Name a legendary work of art. You know, a big, massive, culturally influential work of art. And it's highly likely that it will be connected to one or more of these subjects. Um, so it was interesting to me to look at how a more modern artist handled the material. I don't imagine that this particular piece is on the same level or, or will, could ever possibly have the same impact as, say, 
Dante's Inferno. It's more along the lines of all the great classics have shaped our culture and society. And we have certain concepts embedded in our minds now. And this piece is more about this particular artist's interpretation and view of those ideas and how he builds a story around it. So digging into the technical musical elements, harmonically, it's mostly boring. Um, you might have noticed in some of my previous uh, videos, I talked quite extensively about some harmonic chords, features, things like that. This piece doesn't have a lot of that type worth discussing, but there are some special features where he puts something in that is really harmonically evocative, like chromatic passages or some strange intervals. And I want to talk about both of those because they are fabulous and they work well here. Chromatics first. This is a musical term which we use to talk about some things that happen with the notes in a key or a scale. Well, the word chromatic comes from a root word which has to do with colors and, and shades of coloring. And in music, as I've talked about before, let's just take the major scale, which you should be familiar with now that I've talked about it in previous videos. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, right? So if I step outside of those notes in a piece of music to add some additional tone coloring, instead of just staying with this, now I'm adding some notes that don't belong to the scale, but it can shift the harmony and, and color the music. And King Diamond does that in this piece of music. It's not all the way through the piece, but there are moments where it really strongly features. So as a musician, when I talk about a chromatic scale, I, I'm talking about, it's easy to see on the piano because I'm even using all the colors of the keys, every single color. And so forth, right? And it doesn't always show up that massively in a piece of music, but we use these to give all sorts of moods and shifts. And we musicians like to talk about tone coloring and, and sh the colors and the shapes that we imagine in our music. It's, we don't think of it as just poking out notes on the keyboard. So how does that happen in this song? The first place this shows up in at the graves is at minute 113. And you hear the organ, which is just entering, and it's making this little walking up and down several times over. And so on. And that is setting up this sort of chromatic shading in the music. And it kind of gives this sort of creepy, are we walking down into the grave? Are we walking up out of the grave? Are we, you know, are we going down some creepy stairs? What's happening here? And then the most wonderful thing happens because that comes to an end. And then, then we hear, rise from your grave, little sister, on this note. And then, then that phrase echoes and it hangs there for a moment. Next thing we hear, is this wonderful little chromatic bass line, which as the voice shifts into a scream, rise, and then rise, and then rise, and then once more, rise. And it's like, it's like he's trying to pull her up out of the grave, up and up and up, every little step of the way. It's really, I think, brilliantly done. And it does a wonderful job of evoking 
feelings and images and ideas in our mind in that moment. Go check out those minutes and see if you can hear it in the music. And、um, I think you'll enjoy being aware of what's happening there. The other harmonic feature I want to talk about is what we musicians call a tritone.、Um, it has this nickname applied to it, which goes all the way back to medieval times Diabolus in musica, the devil in music. And it's a very unstable sounding interval. Here's one. And It was very much avoided, and, and music theorists of the medieval era really kind of prohibited it from being used in ecclesiastical music because of its association with being a sort of evil, devilish interval. By the time we get to the Baroque and classical periods, okay, let me give you some dates. Let's say the 16 and 1700s.、Um, then it starts to be used with certain permissions in a very constrained manner where it's allowed in the concepts of how music is meant to be. But it wasn't until the Romantic and modern eras. When it came to be used without constraints and rules around it. And then we start hearing it used to exploit this evil cultural association that we have with it. For example, I'm going to include a link to Franz Liszt's Dante Sonata for piano. And in the Andante Maestoso movement, he opens with a tritone series. To suggest hell. And the interval that you hear starts and then it goes down to and then further and then further and so forth. And it's this dangerous, evil, scary sound that he is trying to, to give us as belonging to hell and. Referencing Dante's literary work. You hear this interval, this devil in music, in At the Graves a lot. And one easy moment to catch it, if you're not used to picking out these sorts of sounds, is at minute three. I think it's 301 or something where it enters, but start at three. And you'll hear the bass voice, the, the bass line, working with the voice. To help make it stand out. And it goes like this. Okay? And this is the interval we hear. It's kind of awkward to sing, awkward to listen to. It feels edgy and bad. And you notice, not only do we have this, but we have it stepping chromatically. Downwards, giving it an even more dark and evil feeling. You can hear it also in the voice singing up higher. When he goes up high and does some of his wild singing, you hear him going awkward intervals that are tritones.、Um, so that's one of the features that makes this music so effective. Other key elements that Are used successfully to create this unique at the graves atmosphere have to do with the rhythms and the voice. One of the ways that, the, that this is done with the rhythm is that he settles us into a consistent groove where we feel like we could clap the beat just about, we could stick with it, and then just as we think we've got it, he changes it. And suddenly we have to adjust. Now, again, if you're not used to doing this kind of thing, it might be tricky, but try to listen to the piece and listen. Where's the beat? And see if you can keep yourself going exactly steady, and you'll find that 
you're steady, you're going, and then suddenly you are off. And it doesn't work, and then you have to adjust. He does that on purpose. So we're always on edge, unsettled, and uncomfortable. As an example, you can listen to minute 150 to about 220, just an example. It, it's all through the music. It's about 30 seconds. And in that short 30 second span, which is quite short for a song that is nine minutes long, he throws us off three or four times. I didn't count exactly, but it's multiple times. It's kind of like walking with somebody and you get in step and your stride is going nicely and then that person just spontaneously takes a short step and then you're off again and you have to work to adjust your own step and gait to match. The other thing that stood out to me is the voice. You heard me comment on it in the first listen. It's not only the sound of the voice, it's the notes that are being sung. It never really settles either. It's crazy all over the place. One sound type up high, then down low, and then something in, in the middle, and then back here, unpredictable, um, sort of frenetic manner. There's no melodic lyrical flow. You can't easily remember the melody. I've listened to it many times over and in the past few days, and it's still hard for me to recall exactly what the melody is that he's singing, because there's really not that much of a melody in most of the piece. It's hard to sing along to, because you really can't figure out what to expect. Am I complaining about it? Am I finding it negative or without value? No. Now this is an interesting answer because as a teacher, I teach students basic compositional skills. And one of the things that I'm always trying to teach a student is the value of creating a melody that can be remembered and sung because it will stick with the audience, the listener. It will be something they can carry with them to go home with, to go about their lives with. And, and there are tools and rules to making a melody that works like that. You want the listener to be able to come along with you on the musical journey, to, to follow and keep up, to be able to understand. And so, if I had a student bring me something as disjointed and wild as this melody, there is a likelihood that I'll, I would send them back to rework it, because for most purposes, it's not good. But when it's done with a specific artistic purpose, it is highly effective and appropriate. And this is a very good example of that. Of course, to make something other than just a bunch of noise, which has very little or no artistic value, there has to be something to bind it together. There has to be some sense, but it doesn't always have to be obvious and on the surface. In this case, one of the things that helps hold all this wildness together is the relatively simple harmonic structure underneath it which is set up in the first minute and a half, where for the whole minute and a half, the same two chords are repeated in the same pattern over and over again. This gives us from the beginning a reliable foundation on which all this crazy fantastic design can grow out of. And here's what you hear at the beginning. It's a C minor chord, with the dominant G. And it goes like this. Back to C, C, G. And then the pattern comes again. C minor, G, C minor, G. Nine times in a row. Now, of course, there are other things adding in, and so it's not just boring. It, the, the textures, the layers are coming in, the voice enters, all these different things enter. But that is the foundation 
for the first whole minute and a half. And then throughout the song, there are moments where you hear a hint of that coming back, either in the bass line, maybe just that, maybe even. And sometimes the voice will reference it. Sometimes another instrument will, will reference it. Sometimes it's the percussion that references the rhythm of it. And so all of that works to help bind and link. And so it goes. There are a lot of classical pieces which deal with these same themes of death and afterlife and so on. And I've included several links to various pieces below in case you want to explore some of this kind of music by Liszt and Shostakovich and, and so on. Of course, because a lot of classical music is older, it often has much more of a religious perspective. But of all the various music with which I'm familiar, one stood out to me as having quite a bit in common with King Diamond in terms of the musical handling and style. And that is the famous Dies Irae from Verdi's Requiem. And the section I'm thinking of is not terribly long, and you should definitely at least listen to it and compare. And I'd love to hear what you think after, after following this link and, and comparing with King Diamond's song. But notice as you listen and keep your ears open for these specific things. One, it has chromatic lines similar to what the organ was doing in At the Graves. And, and I would love to know if your ears can pick them out. Now, of course, this was written for choir, but the second thing I want you to try to play with in your mind is imagine the choir being one single solo voice. And if you do that, you'll suddenly notice how it's bouncing around all over the ranges and gives this fabulous dramatic wild effect like King Diamond does with his single voice. Also, we don't have guitar here. Instead, we have a full orchestra. But the violins and the brass and the percussion really create this fantastic atmosphere. It's, it's a much richer orchestra sound, but you can still hear all kinds of strange, weird, horrifying, and wild sounds in it. You can even hear some scary sounding whispers partway through. So I think it's a great comparison with At the Graves and a way of seeing how different artists take this subject and explore it in different ways. And of course, I'm not saying that At the Graves is is the same as Vergi's Requiem. And it's, it's not, but it's a fun comparison to make. So, do I like At the Graves? Will I ever listen to it again? Probably not. And why not? It's not because it's a bad musical composition. It's because I'm not drawn to that kind of topic and mood. It's not my personal preference. It's kind of like the same thing with movies. I can certainly recognize that Alfred Hitchcock was, and still is considered, one of the most influential figures in the art of the horror movie. But that doesn't mean that I sit down and say, I want to watch a, I, I want to watch The Birds tonight or anytime ever. I don't have to like or enjoy a certain style of, or piece or subject in order to recognize that something is well done and artistically effective. And I do think that At the Graves does a very fine job for its purpose. And I've dug into some of the technical elements and music theory um, to show you how we can analyze and say it's here and this is why. But you don't even have to know music theory or give a technical analysis to judge this. You can simply listen and notice how this song, At the Graves, successfully pulls your entire being 
into that realm to the point where it can actually give you chills, it can make you feel horrible, it can put you on edge, that means it was very well done for its purpose. In conclusion, I want to make sure that we make this distinction clear. The difference between understanding and recognizing the value of something and having personal preferences. And, and many of you ask and comment and say, I can't listen to that or, or I don't think you will like that or will this end up on your playlist? And it's some things will and some things won't. This is one that certainly won't, but that I don't want that to distract from what I'm saying here, that this is a very well-formed, well-designed piece of music that is highly artistically effective. And it has a definite place in the art realms. And, and I want us to appreciate that even if there are people like me who don't enjoy this type of mood and feeling, I want us to be able to have an open mind and recognize that that's a great work of art. Maybe I don't want it hanging in my living room. Maybe I don't want to have, I don't want to have, uh, maybe I don't want to read Dante's Inferno for bedtime stories. You know, I have personal preferences, but I recognize the value and the artistic integrity of something, even if I don't like it. And this is definitely one of those. Now to my new subscribers, welcome. If you want to receive notifications when I post new content, you can activate that by clicking the little bell next to the subscribe button. If you enjoy my work and want to support this channel, check out my coffee page. It's like Patreon, but better. You will find several different ways to stay in touch or contribute to the development of this community. And click this link to watch the first half of this experience, my first listen and reaction to this King Diamonds at the Graves, and I'll see you all soon.